is our God. Sing with me. Amen. It's good to sing praises to the Lord, praising God, having favor with all the people. That's what God does. We praise him for that. What a time we had yesterday in Happy Five Soccer Club, week number two in the books. Pictures are taken. All the kids looked awesome. I'm sure they had a few different poses, but uh, what a wonderful, beautiful day in the Lord and ministry. And so thank you, God, for the mission work that you give us to do and to fulfill. It is truly an honor and a blessing to uh, be in the midst of the Acts 2 project vision that you've given us, Lord, as an Acts 1A church to, to use sports uh, in our community to touch the lives of people with the gospel. There's lots going on out there. If you're a little bored uh, on a Saturday morning and you're not part of that, but you'd like to witness the testimony of the Lord and Him at work, um, come out. I invite you every year and now this is our 17th season, and it will be very hard to find a parking space. Bob, there's 290-something children out there. Why don't you come out and help us coach? You can take over the whole thing again, man. It would be awesome. It's really sweet to see what God is doing. And, of course, it's, to me, it's just a testimony of God's faithfulness to be able to minister in this way over many, many, many years. And so, again, we thank the Lord. It's just one avenue by which... Again, God, through missions, family, and sports, we carry out what God's called us to do. Speaking of missions, see what I did there? Right? little segue there. Thank you, God. Up on the screen, you'll see a, a slide that represents a few weeks ago, speaking of the mission trips that are uh, before us for 2021. And we had an informational meeting where people that might have shown some interest, I have, hey, I have information, I mean, I have interest in this, could you give me some information on the trips? And uh, when Pastor Randy had that, it's got to be a couple months back now, gosh, I think we did that in February, that the number of people showed up, also a number of people contacted Randy personally and said, I'm interested. Well, uh, now we are at the end of April. Yes, how did we get here? And... Uh, I'd like to say that we had tax day and it came and went, but we haven't had that yet. And so from what I figure, this May 17th thing, I'm just not going to pay taxes anyway. And uh, that's okay. Is that bad? Is that good? Okay. I better pay my taxes. But if they keep on kicking the can down the road, I got no problem. I could put off that for a while. But we're not going to put off what God has called us to do. And so when we hit May, which is next, uh, next Sunday... Next Sunday will be the commitment day for the trip to Honduras. Honduras, of course, is a missions trip that will be tied together to Good News in Action, Vida Nueva. It's an organization, if you see on the walls and see that the different missionaries that we support, uh, they are an organization we support in supporting six different areas of mission work that's going on in Central and South America in the 020 window, Metro America. And Honduras is a, uh, is a three years, maybe two years church plant, Randy, maybe, maybe three, three years. And we have not had the opportunity to get in on this trip in this area, so we're looking forward to it. We're taking a, a trip of whoever wants to be part of it. We still have room for those of you that are interested. Commitment day is next Sunday, meaning that you need to bring your funds for the airfare. The airfare, of course, as you can see, uh, when you say 1550 to 1800, that includes everything. The airfare and what is necessary is something that those that are already signed up, they know about. If you are interested still, been praying about it, missed the time, missed the date, it hits you when Randy was up here speaking a few weeks ago, please contact Pastor Randy. Please contact the office if you don't know how to get a hold of him. We will tie you together if God has put this mission trip on your heart that you're supposed to go. It will be a, a trip of doing some street work and leading people to Christ and also following up with sh some short-term but very meaningful discipleship for that trip. So uh, please, again, if you're wondering or thinking, get a hold of Randy and talk it through as you've been praying through and having a conversation with God about it because time is getting short. It is 
going to be May 2nd, next Sunday, and that is Commitment Day. Join me, Galatians chapter number 4, and we're going to look at our series continuing in Galatians 4 and looking at Free to Live Faith. That's what we have entitled the series. And of course, it is a lot, there's a lot of meaning to that statement and meaning to that series title because, of course, Paul the Apostle is communicating to the churches of Galatia as he said in the very beginning of the letter, look, churches, you need to look at your salvation and be reminded that your salvation is for by grace are you saved through faith. Yes, that's the way it goes. Grace is the way that you get saved, faith, putting your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Well, when it comes to servanthood, serving the Lord, I want to teach you, churches of Galatia and Galatian people, look, you serve the Lord the same way, that you don't now interject the law after salvation and find that that is the way you have fulfillment. Legalism is a dangerous thing. And when we are drawn to saying, okay, now that I'm saved, what are the certain laws that I need to fulfill in order for God to be happy with me now that I'm born again? I'm a son of God. I have all these promises. But, you know, I kind of lost my way, and now I see that this liberty in Christ thing is in the Bible, and, and I understand that. Does that mean that I can do whatever I want, and that'll be fine? And, and does that give me a, a license to just kind of stretch the parameters of God's word? And, and since God called the law a curse, does that mean I can just throw the law out? Hang on now. As we looked at it last week and saw the last few verses of Galatians chapter number 3, we picked it up from 15 through 29, we saw, hey, Paul is still keeping the argument going, and he's making a logical argument last week. Well, this week he's going to make a historical argument for grace, a logical argument for grace last week, and of course this week his historical argument for grace as it says up on the screen last week in our sermon, Galatians 3, 26 through 29, as we finished it out, reminded us that we are adult sons. You are an adult son in the Lord and an heir of Father God, which means that you're bought with a price. You're not your own. The law is your schoolmaster. It is not what you are to follow or attempt to fulfill in your carnality or your daily fleshly outward appearance in order to get some appeasement for God. It is where you and I realize, hey, I'm a son, not just a servant of the law. I'm a son of God. I'm an adopted son of God. And therefore also, too, I'm an heir of Father God in Jesus Christ. It's not about a set of things that you and I think that we can do again to say, okay, I'm going to serve you, God, and if I check this box, if I cross this T right, if I, I dot this I, then that's the way to do it. And Paul's teaching the church at Galatia, the churches of Galatia, no. Oh, foolish Galatians, what happened to you? Why were you bewitched that you should not obey the truth? The truth is that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him, but by me, as he states. He says, I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the bread of life. I am, I am, I am. I'm what you need, and we get bewitched as the churches at Galatia got bewitched. The people of Galatia who are believers got bewitched into believing God's not satisfied. God's not happy with your offerings. God, God wants more of you following the law than for us to live in the liberty of Christ and the liberty in the Holy Spirit. It says in verse number 26, so we're in chapter 4, but let me read 26, 27 of chapter number 3. And I've got 29 will be up there in a minute, but I want you to see this here. To be reminded of the end of chapter number 3 as it goes into chapter number 4. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You put him on. 
You put off the old man, you put on the new man. The new man's in Christ, you put on Jesus Christ. You get that from the Word of God. You get that from the Holy Spirit of God, working through the Word of God for you to put on these new garments. You put on goodness, gentleness, peace, long-suffering because the Holy Spirit within you has changed you and you have that fruit of the Spirit in you. It says in verse 28, to unify the body of Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Verse 29. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye, excuse me, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's how we finish it up. When you look on the screen, you're going, okay, if ye be Christ's in Christ, then you are of Abraham's seed. You are in him. Also, that seed, to be reminded doctrinally, is in Jesus Christ. When you and I see that and we look at that, we go, wow, what a deal that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. If he be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed. Remember, the, the law could never make us heirs of God. God made this promise to Abraham's seed. That seed is Jesus Christ. Remember last week. So i got to give you a context of where we're headed. The law cannot do what the promise could do. And the promise, of course, was given to Abraham, fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. The law was given to what? Prepare the way for Jesus Christ. Everything is about Jesus Christ. So you're sitting in that place and you're saying, I got it, Pastor. Leave me alone on that. Let's move on to something more important. There's nothing more important. Because you and I find other things that are important in our religious ways in order to somehow, again, find a validation with the Lord. The law could never make us heirs of God, as I said earlier. God made the promise to Abraham that seed is in Christ. If you are in Christ by faith, then you are also too. We are Abraham's seed. And as I said in the first service, I'm reminded to tell you in this time, in this service as well, God's seed in Christ ensures that we as Christians, all believers in Christ today, are enriched spiritually. You get the promise of Abraham and promise in Abraham and his seed. You get all that stuff there, but you also have even more because God's seed in Christ ensures all. We're heirs of the spiritual blessings that are promised to Abraham. But it's not like we're a quote, quote unquote, the, the nation of Israel that way. It doesn't mean it, that it's the material and national blessings that are found and promised to Israel. They've been set aside. They're set aside for now. God will come back to deal with them one last time. But you and I sit in a place where as Christians, hey, we've got it all in Jesus Christ. Spiritually speaking, you could want nothing more than in being him. So if that's the case, then you look up at the screen and you say, and by the way, this is an example of my really fine mastery of the English language. Many who be Christ's, I don't know if that even works, is that okay? I did big bolds and, you know, all that stuff and super duper. Just think for a minute from that verse in verse number 29. If ye be Christ, which we are. Many who be Christ, though, have chosen to live in the outhouse of life instead of the Father's house. What's the outhouse? The place where you leave the home to do things that you must do. And it's a place where, unfortunately, we live in a picture, a type of, hey, I, I'm just going to live out here in the bad spot. The rough spot. I know that I'm a Christian, but <laughs> I know I'm a believer in Christ. <laughs> but life, I don't know. I just, I like being over here. What is it with us, adopted sons of God, that we would say, ah, the Father's house, living in the Father's house, uh, doing life in the Father's house, walking with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God, through the truth of his word. Ah, that's just not, it's too tough. Well, many, I know it because of experience and a few years of pastoring and being a brother in the Lord with many, many people, this and statement reminds you and me of what our condition was under the law as a man. We were condemned. 
But man's condition in the Lord Jesus Christ is that we're born again. We're sons of God. And as Paul's carrying this thing through, he's saying, look, if ye be Christ, then you're of Abraham's seed and your heirs according to the promise. And you are in Jesus Christ. Why live any other way? Well, if Paul's saying it in 51, 52, whatever, uh, early 50 ADs as he's writing this, well, I guess that must be just for those Christians. They, they don't have it together like we do now. I mean, we got it together, and we don't get drawn into legalism. We don't get drawn into trying to obey the law to appease God. We don't look to just get a set of rules in this world to be able to somehow affirm and validate, again, what we think is good religious Christianity. No, we don't do that. Huh. It's interesting when we open up the Word of God that we're trying to find something that fits our little time frame that we're in. I challenge you to open up the Word of God and read it from front to back and let God speak to you wherever he wants to speak to you. Stop trying to find some certain way of asking God certain things and going and just finding certain answers to things because this passage of Scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, verse by verse, is showing us something that is truly a, a, a real difficulty for Christians today as much as it was almost 2,000 years ago. It says up on the screen this as well. It says, hey, your attempted growth in Christ if it's done in that legalism way, making some, some person, man, some leader happy, maybe it's yourself coming up with your own package. Tragically, it leads to an empty life. Just for a second, think. If you've ever been in a place or you know others that have, they're saved, they're born again, but they've spent a lot of time in this legalism place. they spent a lot of time in desiring to earn some kind of favor from God. And this attempted growth in Christ has now got a ceiling about this high for God to work. God wants to take you above that ceiling. God wants to ha have you understand eternity. God wants you to know that the Father's house is a whole lot better place to live than in the outhouse of life. It's a whole lot better to just live this life in Christ, fulfilled and not empty, but full in Jesus. Or some people that hit that legalism block and try to find a way of not getting close to God, but just doing what they're told. They have a good heart about it. They're thinking, okay, my mom and dad told me to do it. The church told me to do it. Everybody told me to do it. And that's fine because there are things that God's word says that we're to do. But if you're doing it as a born-again Christian, a, a, a Christian that knows Jesus Christ, to say, there's no doubt in your mind and heart that you're saved, born again. But yet you said, huh, they don't even care about me. They don't love me. But we know the old phrase. Those rules, without relationship, lead to rebellion. We've all heard that. If you haven't, now you have. And that's a place where we go, and you say, well, where does that come from? It comes from the Bible. Because Paul the Apostle's teaching the exact things that you and I know to be true in our lives, that if we attempt to grow in Christ without the word, Without the Holy Spirit leading, that's a legalistic way of following a bunch of rules. Again, to on the outside make everybody believe everything's fine. It tragically leads to an empty life where there's really not a whole lot of essence and desire and fruit for the Lord. Faith has been pushed aside for works Somehow, some way, that the law comes creeping back. Your set of laws, a little bit of God's laws, a little bit of church laws, a little bit of all kinds of laws. And now there's an emptiness there. You need to do the work on your own. If you are saved, born again, get into the word of God. Find out what he has to say for you to have a beautiful relationship with him. You say, I don't have many relationships with people that go to church. I don't have a lot of friends that are Christians. Fine. Leave it there for now. But if you get closer to the Lord, I promise you, you will not have an empty life. You will have a full life. 
You will start being filled by God's incredible grace and mercy and love. The fruit of the Spirit will come alive. The Word of God will dwell in you richly. You will have the mind of Christ. You will think like Christ. And I promise you, if you look like Christ and you think like Christ, people will love to be around you. You will not have an empty life. You say, well, hey, what about this riotous living thing? This is part of the introduction. We'll get into the message here in a second. But listen to me. This riotous living is damnation on this earth even for someone who's born again because they're going to lose their physical life. They're not going to lose their life eternally because they're born again, they're adopted children, and they know Christ as Savior. But the Bible teaches that their physical life will be taken away. And I promise you that it's true from personal experience. I need not say anything more. Because it will happen. God's word is true. Not every life will be that way. But God's word says, you may surely die. Not die, spiritually speaking, because you're born again, you're alive in Christ, and so you're truly born again. But going to a place of riotous living, boy, oh boy, I promise you one thing. You keep on taking it to the end. God's word is true. And you don't know when his grace is no longer going to be executed. His mercy is going to be executed upon your life. And you have no idea when God says, come home, my child. I love you. I can't let you live like that anymore. I'm going to take you home. No more. And those that are left behind, understand, that is not the way that God meant for you to live your life as an adopted son of God. He meant for you and me to live that life being Christ, to be Christ. So that gives you the title of our message today, Life in the Father's House. This is life in the Father's house that we're going to look at for a few minutes. Life the way that you and I can live it in the Father's way. The Father's truth, the Father's life that comes by Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am my Father, our one. And if you want just a really good, fun study for 2021, jump in and check out the relationship between God the Son and God the Father. And see how much they were one together. And how Jesus lived his life on this earth tied together to the Father's house. Which is eternity in heaven. In that place where the tabernacle is. Where everything is laid out for us one day to be with him. And Jesus Christ's life on this earth was lived in the Father's house. That's how he saw it. That's what we see today in Galatians chapter number 4. I want to cover verses 1 through 11 today. I want us to kind of see what God has. So we're going to read it through, get a little bit, I'll give you a little background here, maybe a little doctrinal teaching here, and then we'll get into some practical applications at the end, and then we'll walk right into our time in the Lord, in the Lord's Supper, communing closely with Him. Why don't you join me as we pick up In Galatians 4, verse number 1, we've read the few verses before. Now we have a context of what Paul's getting across to these Galatian believers, just like us, repeating himself and repeating himself to get a point across. Watch the point he makes. Now I say, verse number 1, that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors And governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Very simply, as you see just a few verses, just keep in mind the text here. Uh, Paul saying, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. There's no difference in that physical picture in the law of someone who's born to inheritance 
or someone who's a servant to a master until the father of the house acclaims and legally speaks that that person is an adult son who now has that coming out. In the Jewish religion, the, the Roman culture, uh, the Grecian culture, they all had a coming out, a recognition of adulthood for the inherited person. The, excuse me, the one that's going to get the inheritance, the heir. But a child is still a child, just like a servant in the home, and they have to be acknowledged so until the family, until the father says, now you are an heir. You are now an adult son. Keep that in mind as we get into this word about how we become adult sons. Verse number six. And because you're sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We had our men's conference. That was the name, that was the title of our conference, Abba, Father. Uh, Pastor Roe Porter preached through uh, incredible messages, three incredible messages on this subject of having relationship with the Father in prayer. It was absolutely, I, I could never, and I just pray that God will use this word here for this particular message, but the way he went about it was tremendous in breaking down what verse number six really means, Abba, Father, Daddy, my Father, 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 I'm calling out to you. Verse seven, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. See what's happening here? The whole idea of how it is in the physical, following the law, but now in the spirit, in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are sons, sons of God. We're adopted. We're heirs of God through Christ. Verse number eight, how be it then? When ye knew not God, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. Simple. Simple. When you knew not God, you still followed after some type of lordship, fathership, heirship. You were following after something that you would have, get an inheritance to when you were lost. That's what we do. But then you come to Christ, you're an adopted son. Now you're in God as a son, not the son, but sons of God as adopted children. Abba, Father, a different relationship. So that's established, right? So by chapter 4, these bunch of Christians should have this down really good, like you and me, right? We, we really got this down good. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we got this. Look at verse number 9, 10, and 11. But now, but now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, that means relationship with God through Jesus Christ, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Why nation of Israel would you call out to go back to Egypt? Why church, born again believer, why would you call out to go back and live by the world's direction, by the world's powers? He says in verse number 10, ye observe days, months, and times, and days, I am afraid, verse number 11, for you. He says, I am afraid of you. I said that intentionally the wrong way. He doesn't say I'm afraid for you. He says I'm afraid of you. Why would he be afraid of them? He explains very simply. Lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. I'm afraid of you. Because all the teaching that I've put forth for you to grab a handle on living your life in the Father's house, of living as an adopted son of God, all the teaching of being a believer in Jesus Christ and all that that has in sanctification, I'm afraid of you that you have taken all that and cast it aside like it's vanity that I did it all in vain like it was for nothing because now you are converted in Christ as an adopted son. You are known of God and you know God and yet you live as if no one could even identify you as a son of God. See, life in the Father's house is a whole lot better. 
Life in the Father's house, as we've been seeing, of course, and Paul making all of his arguments in the last few weeks and what we've been learning, reminds us that, hey, chapter 3 and 4 cover a lot of stuff. The Galatians began by faith and they needed to continue in faith. Abraham was justified by faith. Uh, justified by faith. And, and, and by the way, those same principles are supposed to continue where, hey, today we're supposed to still live in that faith. Christ redeemed us and we're to trust in him. And we're supposed to trust in him away from the curse of the law. These are the things that Paul has covered. I'm just giving you a quick reminder. The promise made to Abraham before the law was given was not nullified by the law, but the law was given to condemn, to show men their powerlessness. 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 How about we just go, they didn't have any power. Okay, let's do that. Or you couldn't meet God's expectation. That's why it was given, to drive them to faith. And Paul also taught, like we just read a little bit, that believers are the adopted sons of God and are no longer bound by the law. So Paul's historical argument for grace goes something like this for just a couple of minutes. Just some highlights here, just to remind you. You see, Paul's historical argument really shows us, as I said earlier, that we're not an heir until a certain legal age. But when you get saved, born again, five years old, eight years old, 10, 15, call in the name of the Lord to save you. Any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves as the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. You know what happens in that moment? You become a grown-up son. Now, some of you haven't grown up yet. I know that. But you become an adult son. Why? Because the definition of an heir to the family of God is an adult son. You are now not just a little child in the home that's treated like the servants are treated. You are now in God's eyes an adult son. Yes, you have to grow in the Lord. So spiritually speaking, you start out with, as a babe learning some things in the word. But here's what he's teaching here in verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. He's saying also, too, our bondage is something that came and is part of how we can be pulled back in, verse number 3, because of his creation. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. When you're lost... You are a creature of God. He has made you and he has formed you. But he's saying, hey, just as that those elements of the world held people in bondage, the law did and everything that's there, something had to happen. And that's what verse number four is. And I just want to visit that for a little bit before we move on because it's very, very important. It has a few phrases there, verse number four and verse number five. The fullness of the time was come. God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of the sons. Everything included in there, each piece and part is very important because the birth of the Messiah was a fulfillment of God's prophecy. The birth of the, of the Messiah was God saying, I promised and here's the promise that's going to be fulfilled. The birth of the Messiah was laid out in Genesis 3, Genesis 12, Isaiah chapter number 7, and on and on in the Old Testament in the fullness of time. That is a reference to how you and I have to re just really just go, God, in your providence, you sent Jesus Christ exactly when you said he needed to, be co to come, when, he, when the fullness of time needed to be fulfilled. And as it says in uh, Philippians chapter number 2, he was made in the likeness of men. He was made as a servant and, and for the form of a servant, and it was all in the fullness of time. He was also made of a woman. And we understand this and, and know it, but it's all off of what it says in the scriptures, Genesis chapter number three, God sent forth his son, and it shows us clearly what we need to grasp all the time. He was fully the son of God, he was fully the son of man, and this is Jesus Christ. All of this is a fulfillment of God's holy and perfect word of God. He was made under the law. When he came, the law was prevalent. The law was the way to go. Grace was not, in the Jews' eyes, anything that God had done when they had just missed all that he had done. Because Jesus Christ was born, as it says in 
Galatians 3.10, under the curse. Under the curse. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things. Christ hath redeemed us, in verse number 13, from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Jesus Christ came in the exact time that God would have him to come. Fullness of time, made of a woman, made under the law, the adoption of sons. And as we look at all this, we're reminded as he sent forth his son. In that beautiful verse, in verse number six, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Everything that you see here scripturally, doctrinally lays back to the historical account of God's word being fulfilled. You know what? My adoptive status, since I was, of course, born, I was born as a child of Frank and Francis Brown, but I was born again by the Father through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit's sealing to the day of redemption. And my adoption came in a place where now I see, whoa, as God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, that changes my birth my spiritual birth now supersedes my physical birth. And you know the old phrase goes, born twice, die once. Born once, die twice. If you don't know what that means, ask your neighbor. They'll tell you exactly what it means. When you see in verse number 7, Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son of a son than an heir of God through Christ. Then again, it keeps on coming. The son has the same nature as the father. The servant does not. The son has a father. The servant has a master. Again, it's clear the difference that we have. Being born as a servant into a family, yes. But born again as a son into God's family, remember what he's teaching us here. This is God's way. And now as sons of God, we say, God, what would you have me to do? For by grace are you saved through faith. Okay, God, I got saved for by grace are you saved through faith and then not of yourselves is the gift of God. Then guess what? I'm going to take the word of God and I'm going to look at this historical argument for grace and say, it's always been you, God. My logical argument for grace is what Paul made. He says, I made a scriptural argument for grace. I made a personal argument for grace. And now I lay all this before you, people of Galatia, people of first Bible, people in God's kingdom, God's work, God's church, and say, hey, you are rich beyond measure because you're a son of God. You have a future, and it's not undone. In fact, the future is coming. And it's not quite fulfilled yet for you, but one day we'll be in glory together and see the Father's house. That's the whole thinking we have today. The Father's house is the way to live and living in the Father's way of things. Adopted sons of God is the way that Paul's telling us. Well, let me show you three simple things this morning that after looking and breaking this down, because I'm going to get to verses 9, 10, and 11 here in one of our points of, of our statements of application and personal application by seeing what God really, really wants us to take out of this. The first thing I want you to see in the Father's house is that there can be great conversation. Now follow along with me for a moment. Great conversations happen in the Father's house. They don't happen in the law-imposed, fleshly-fulfilling outhouse of life that you like to live in. That's where the Judaizers come along and they say, hey, I object to the grace. I object to life by faith. I object to anything that's against the law. I'm a Judaizer. I'm someone that's converted to the, person that, converted to the law, and I'm a person that loves the law. And what Paul's doing is squashing all that. Because their objections, Paul is squashing and he's saying, when you live in the Father's house, you have great conversation. You're able to have this conversation with the Father because you're an adopted son of God. And you can talk about being a son and the Father, not a servant. You say, well, being a servant, is that bad? No. But when you take the context of the passage of Scripture, being a servant meant, hey, you only have a relationship to the person of the house as a master. 
The servant cannot call that father of the house father. As you're a child of God in your picture, immediately when you got saved, you became an adult son, as I said earlier, and you immediately start calling him Abba, Father. Now, let me just just, just throw this out at you. What are your conversations like with the Father? Do you talk about the things of the Father like Jesus Christ did? I mentioned that earlier. What is it about your conversations with the Father? Because a servant's life is filled with bondage, but a son's life is filled with freedom in the Holy Ghost. You're free. You have liberty in Christ, and you can talk to the Father about anything. He will not, he will not reject you. He will not diminish your prayer, your words, your thoughts. He wants to have relationship with you. Who am I talking to? The sons of God. If you're not born again, then I promise you by the scripture's teaching that your words that you're saying to God in heaven, they really don't have as much of a meaning. I know that we have the account of Cornelius calling out to God, and God answers him because of his righteousness and by his faith in God to do something where I see that that is truly truly important because he was looking for the truth of what it would take to be converted and have a relationship with God by faith. But if you're just there as a lost person and you're saying, hey, I'm trying to get into the Father's house. I'm trying to have a great conversation. And if you're not a son through the Lord Jesus Christ by what the Word of God teaches, that whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, that thou shalt believe in thy heart that God had raised him the dead after confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you don't have that adoption, you don't have that relationship with God that pleased him. And that's where you just say, my conversations seem like they're meaningless. They don't get anywhere. Now, a believer, a son of God, can have a similar type of conversation, but if that's all the conversations you have had all your life, then you ought to check where you're at because the father does not reject his sons. He welcomes them with open arms to say, hey, father, I repent. Father, please. Father, I, I ask you. I know that you've forgiven me. I know that you've washed my sins away as east is from the west. I, I just want you to know that I've made a mess out of things and I'm coming back to you and I want you, father, please, please to have better relationship with me because I'm the one who's made this relationship bad. The son then, in that beautiful conversation, can have open relationship. I wonder how many of his adopted children have a good relationship with him in conversation. Well, I did my prayers for the week. I did my prayer time for three minutes. I had a long list of things that I needed to pray for. I needed to make sure that I had three minutes of prayer time on my way to work, maybe four. In the Father's house, there's great conversation. Talking about being a son in the Father, not a servant. I'm fearful that many believers have relegated their relationship to a place of legalism so deeply that they don't even know they're doing it. And because of that, your life and relationship with God as an adopted son is somehow empty. Don't you think maybe it'd be a good way to turn it around? If you look at Romans chapter number eight, and I've just used that as a supporting passage, and of course it is a companion book to this. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Verse number 16 continues to come. In verse number 17, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. What does the Father hear when he hears us talk to him? What kind of conversations would you have with the one who you've received heir from, heirship? You are a joint heir with Christ. Why would we treat the Father so poorly in the Father's house? There's great conversations. 
also two in the Father's house, as you look up on the screen. There is great confidence. What do you mean by confidence, Pastor? Well, there is great confidence glorying in the future with Christ, not in the present time. Are you stuck in this present time? Stuck in the trials, the heartaches, the difficulties? Are you in a place where you have forgotten that you've been redeemed from them? You're redeemed from what you were under the religious law of finding some way to earn your way to heaven. Now you're in Christ. You're an adopted son of God. You're a joint heir with Jesus and you can come to the Father. You have been set free by him paying the price. So as a redeemed son of God, you have been purchased not to be a slave. You have not been purchased to be thumbed under just like a slave would be in a house where they had to do all kinds of chores in in order to earn their freedom or earn their way. You've been redeemed. You've been purchased by a price that you could not pay. And now, guess what? You are forever in that place where you can say, woohoo, I glory in the future with Christ. Now, if, if that doesn't mean much to you, then I wonder if it's the same thing as Paul's saying here. Is all that I have taught in vain. Have you been satisfied and become satisfied with just complaining and criticizing of the plight that you have in life? Have you come to a point where all the trials and sufferings, you don't recognize them, that they're from God? You see that as, oh, God doesn't care about me. Oh, God, I'm your son. I'm a child of God. You said I'm an heir. You said that I'm not a servant. You said that I'm more than that, that I could come to you and have conversation with you. And now I say, hey, I have great confidence in you, and you let me down, and you let me down, you let me down, and God's saying, wait a minute. Romans chapter number 8, verse 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, this present time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I hear people flippantly say that verse, and I'm so scared that you don't understand the depth of what you're saying. You whine, you complain, you criticize about all the things you're going through, and Jesus Christ is telling us, hey, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Why are you so stuck here thinking that this is all you've got? When God's saying, have confidence in me that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So when you think for a minute, can I have confidence, great confidence, glorying in the future with Christ, not in the present time? Yeah, then put a smile on your face. Try it a little bit. It's not that bad. You don't understand what I'm going through. I say that, what what do you mean? It doesn't matter. God understands. Your father understands. He wants intimate conversation with you. You give him 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 minutes and you think you've given him a lot. My goodness, you are his son. I am his son. Why is he treated like he is your master and you are his slave? You are a child of God. And you can have confidence in him that everything that you think is really, really rough to go through is nothing, nothing, to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And then lastly, in the Father's house, not in the outhouse, but in the Father's house, there's great communion. Communion is when you experience liberty in the Holy Spirit, not bondage to sin. You say, how do I get out of this sin that I'm in past? How do I get out of the awful mess that I've got myself into? Come unto me, all ye that labor and have, are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. As David said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me. I want to experience the liberty and the Holy Spirit of God that is talked about 
here in the book of Galatians that we get to in next chapter. I want to live there. Well, then you have to do something about it. I'll preach and teach and shepherd and lead you in a place, but I want you to have a life that is fulfilled living in the Father's house. There is great communion there. You say, will that mean that all my difficult problems are going to be taken away? Now you're going back to fulfilling the law. If I do this and I do this and I do this and I do this, then everything's going to be fine. What kind of adoption that would the father make to a son to say, well, here's the 20 things you have to do, conditionally speaking, in order for you to get your relationship with me back. How about coming to him with a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, thou will not despise. It says there in verse number 20 in Romans number 8, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by the reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. God put all this before you in this world to have you realize that it cannot fulfill anything and that he can fulfill everything in himself. Because the creature itself in verse number 21 also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption and to the glorious liberty of the children of God. Thank you, God. It says in verse number 9 in Galatians 4, But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements. You know what those weak and beggarly elements are? Humanism, self-righteousness, self-sufficiency, the world's imposed power upon you. I just need to please the people that are in government. I just need to make everybody that's around me happy. I need to just leave, I just need to appease them and they'll leave me alone. Whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? Do you really want to go back in bondage to fulfilling some laws of the world that you live in so that then you'll be happy? For any of you that have tried that, I'm sure you can testify that doesn't work, Pastor. You're right. Paul the Apostle says it doesn't work. Romans, again, chapter number 8, as I talked all about that. In verse 15, very simply it said, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby you're crying, Abba, Father, just like it says here in Galatians, chapter number 4, verse 6. The Father's house has confidence for you, great confidence. It has great communion for you. It has great communications for you and for me. I pray that you can see the necessity, the incredible beauty of living in his grace as an adopted son of God can mean to your life and make it so freeing where it's not a life of oh, riotous living or a life of empty living but rather a life completely fulfilled as again a son of God. It says up on the screen as we go into the Lord's Supper as adopted sons of God by grace through faith we humbly come to the Lord's Supper why? Because this is a time for us to celebrate the Lord, for us to have a time where we say, I know what you've done for me, Father. I know who you are in my life. Because of Jesus Christ, I'm an adopted son. You're no longer a slave to the law. Please join me in a word of prayer as we go into the Lord's Supper. I pray that you'll take the time to examine your hearts and take the time to be prepared as we come to get the elements here in a moment. Thank you, Father, for your living word. Thank you, Father, for your beautiful word. Thank you for what you have given us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, thank you for the Holy Spirit's work in us through the word where we cry, Abba, Father. We're having communion with you, confidence in you, conversation with you, Father, and we love you for that. It's incredible who you are for us as we are your sons. And now, because of you, Jesus, we have the opportunity to rejoice over your suffering. That's, that's a crazy thought, but that's what it is. We rejoice in you for all the suffering, the broken body and the shed blood on the cross. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we come and examine our own hearts, 
so that we would not partake unworthily. So God, as your church, we come, our Father, in the name of Jesus, as your sons, and say, prepare our hearts as we prepare them before you, in Jesus' name.